infatuation with acronyms. And today we had a great one from Sarita Bazaar, the women leader. It'll take a while to remember because that's much longer. KME ultimately means cardiorenal and metabolic improvement. We've been talking about cardiorenal and metabolic protection for a long time. Uh, American Heart Society thought they have been left behind by the endocrinologists and American Diabetic Association. So in order to nam karan different kare, they made it cardio kidney metabolism. But fundamentally meaning the same. Now you know, you know, in 19, late 1980s, uh, when echocardiographs started becoming a problem, when I did my endocrinology, there was no ultrasound known. There were no CT scans. The whole uh, endocrinology meant uh, what, again, Sirita Madams and Rosalind Yellow's radio MNSA. And WHO established one of the it was a WHO-sponsored project having a radio MNSA lab at PJ. That's how they could start a game and a chronology, which organization did not start for a long time. But when this echocardiography came, if you look back at screen data, people started coming up in diabetes care. Left ventricular dysfunction, not in diabetes alone, but in people who have impaired glucose tolerance. So it was very well known that people have a cardiac impact even before they have developed clinical diabetes because when you develop clinical diabetes, you never know how long you have had diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes, or how long you have had pre-diabetes, and which has been impacting the body. So in a similar fashion, you know, if you look at so-called, so-called quote-unquote new diabetes, we published a study, in depth study, because a study in uh, uh, Diabetes India. Uh, complication profile in type 2 diabetes had the answer. 30% would have some form of a complication. And that urine protein, we never take organisms of. The way we never took organisms of, that's quote unquote fatty urine. So it is known that cardiac and renal involvement in a subtle fashion might occur much earlier than we actually quantify them and they also dictate how the cardiovascular health is going to be. Now just look at this slide. Many of us who are of my age or a decade younger or two, the cardiac disease in our whole life, man, you know, when in the medical college, uh, doing the MD, doing DM, when rheumatic heart disease or congenital heart disease. Coronary heart disease was not the word that we heard of. We used to call it ischemic heart disease. And it was supposed to be rare in England. But now look at it today. This is a National Commission looking at coronary artery disease. Now the only thing that is increasing is coronary artery disease. It is stuck over a period of a decade. And this is the impact of that obesity that I was telling you just now. This is the impact of diabetes that I've been telling you just now. And this is the impact of poor control of hypertension. This is a paper that we published almost two and a half decades back. Looking at mortality in patients with diabetes, data of a decade. We found out that infection is still killing diabetics as well as non-diabetics in this part of the world. And second most important cause of death was renal failure, renal dysfunction. Because we never reach there by you die of heart disease because renal failure occurs much earlier with the hemoglobin A1C of 9.9 .9 and blood pressure of 180, 110. That problem. And this is the data that we published a decade later, another decade is later. People were living longer, diabetics were living longer, the gap between diabetes and non-diabetes were shrinking. But renal failure still was predominant there. So again, you know, because we don't take cognizant. To us, uh, EGFR, of, we never actually calculated that EGFR. We never were aware of a urinary protein urea, so it kept on happening. So that's why they were a prelude to this cardiometabolic disease in a patient who had a cardiorenal disease who had a metabolic dysfunction. Now, if you take a cursory look at people whose 
ejection fraction has started going down, who have started having some form of a CKD which I will allude to. In today's contemporary world, two to five fold increase in heart failure in patients with diabetes. 60% greater probability of living with cardiovascular death and all cause mortality. Half the people will have some form of a NAFLD or metabolic dysfunction associated fatty liver disease. 2.5 to 10 percent will succumb to the chronic liver disease. And half the people would qualify for CKD. Half the people, if we look for it, would qualify for CKD. Now, this is a real world data from the Western world. It was discussed in Barcelona. And if you look critically, it's a data on 137,000 people who did not have an overt cognizable cardiovascular disease. If you critically look by doing ejection fractions and looking at the circulating factors that BNPs, and if you look at critically at EGFR and microproteinuria, 60% will have one of these two things to reckon with. And why it's important? If you initially at any stage find out your EGFR is dropping down, it does not mean that you have a real failure or patient has a real failure. If you drop from 90 to 60, something is happening. Because if it drops from 90 to 60, what prevents it dropping from 60 to 50, 50 to 40, right? So if somebody's ejection fraction drops over a period of a year, if you have not been able to control it, it will continue falling. So found out, if you have these two comorbidities, all cause mortality would be high. Cardiovascular death would be high. If you are there right from the beginning, because they are the harbingers of telling us that intracellular, intracellular, intravascular disease is at an advanced stage. Okay, when you see HBA, you see disease is too over, the 400 blood sugar is too over. But when I is going up and down, many things have been happening in the body, which so far we have not been quantifying. So that's why over the last one decade, we have been trying to tell each other that one, we try to achieve as good a glycemic control as possible. But simultaneously put a protective cover around heart and kidney. That's why the guidelines change that you should do statins to everybody after 40. The only difference is do we do moderate dose of statins or a high dose of statins, not that whether you give it or not. Do you renew protection? Do you do ACE inhibitors? With or without hypertension. If you have hypertension, give them the maximum tolerated doses with whatever cardio benefit and renew benefits it has. So things started changing from that moment onwards. Now what did dapoglyphosin do? One, this I will not elaborate because people have been talking about this a decade and a half. A reasonably moderate to good oral hypoglycemic agent causes a drop in hemoglobin A1C from 0.84 to 1.32 depending on what the initial HbA1c was as I showed you in the initial talk. Higher the HbA1c when the you could drop by hemoglobin A1c by 2.6 in BVC amplified but consistently doing it. And this consistent control of hyperglycemia or HbA1c seems to be longer lasting because in the initial time we were looking and comparing the sulfonylurea zone. This is compared with Gilipizade. Now we heard of DAPA CKD trial, but let us look at DAPA and renal failure from a different perspective. Now just look at it. There are different grades of this. See, we quantify, uh, let's say, a disease in the retina, background retinopathy, proliferative retinopathy, and stage, you have a virtuous hemorrhage. In a similar fashion, there are different stages which I will come down to of. And most of the times, you know, here we do not recognize the problem. At least here and here it should be recognized. But most of the times when there is an end-stage kidney disease, 
when you need a renal replacement therapy, when we run around. Every day I am seeing patients, which all of you must be seeing. First time coming, we have the creatinine of 3, blood sugar of 300, 400. Blood sugar has become better. Now, I, I told the day before, yesterday, one patient asked, I am better. So, Baran's initial LBA1C was 7.2. Low below the old man, only said, Sir, creatinine to vice ka vice hai. So, I fell down. Because he was right. Because 3.2 or 2.8 means other fell in because nobody meant that decision here. Everybody meant that. So look at it. Here is the big, big broad base, but diagnosis in my view. And that's why we lose that window of opportunity to change the natural history of a disease. Now look at it. If you look at it, no treatment. If you don't give a treatment, a person gets renal failure here. You get the new treatment, you add on an average four years of quality life before a person would need a renal replacement therapy. I'm so like, you know, you give a proper drug, you delay possibility of a renal transplant or dialysis by four years. If you give it right in time. Now, what does that mean, right in time? Now, look at it. You have an easier file? More than 60, which it should be in most of the people, particularly younger people, 70, 80, 90 plus 100. Now, <coughs> this is where we are, need to be. And when it starts dropping down, this is not real, it's so good. And here, I have to see, at least here we need to take care of it. The moment EGFR reaches the 60 or less, we need to put protective mechanisms in place to save this kid. But that does not happen because now creatinine at that stage is only 1.3 has gone to 1.4. Nothing has changed in a big way. And by the time it's here, that's where two or three comes in. It would not reverse in a very big way. So in a similar fashion, if you look at protein urea, normal to mild increase. If you have less than three milligrams per mole, it's the great window of opportunity in Moderate, yes, good. You can still make impact at any stage. But if you delay it, particularly in this, say, end stage kidney disease, proteinuria, there is no preventive strategy. There is only management strategy, real replacement therapy. Now, we have heard of credence, uh, we have heard of APA kidney, we have EMPA kidney. But this is not what I am telling you. This is the cardiovascular outcome studies, not talking about cardiovascular outcome. All these data showed that it has a renoprotective effect. It had come now, before they looked at the specific kidney points, if you look at phase 2, phase 3 clinical trials, the accumulated data shows that it has a renoprotective effect. And even in the declare, which was a cardiovascular outcome trial, you can see when renal failure was, EGFR was 47% risk reduction in those people who were on double blood when we did not talk about renal protection. These studies were going on and we initially looking at is it a good oral hypoglycemic, is it a safe hypoglycemic, then we are saying is it cardiovascular or safe. And this was data already there, which was never brought to the fore. Now look at it. A summary whose EGFR is dropping does not have what you and me conceive as renal failure. Gradually enough to <coughs> Or what you and me Consider as heart failure, why do we need FGL <coughs> inhibitors, beta blockers, why MADAs and <coughs> pseudobutal, low salt and combinations. If you look at laboratory determined renal dysfunction and heart failure, then you look at people and follow them up. All when you look at renal outcomes in the long run, better than people who are under population. And stage kidney disease lesser in people who are at of blood. Cardiovascular death benefits. And stage kidney disease or even death, huge benefit to the top. In that people as you study them. Now if you look at just urine albumin creatinine ratio, if you start it, 
as a significant reversal of macroproteinuria or reduction of macroproteinuria or non progression again favors to dopaglyphosis now if you specifically talk about the ckd dapa ckd was a very amazing trial data on more than 5000 guys they looked at this molecule for preventing the progression of the renal disease in diabetics as well as in non diabetics and this study like creatins had to be stopped in the middle because data monitoring community found out that people who were on dapagliflozin had a huge benefit to say it will be unethical if the drug is not given to people who have who are not on dapaglyph who are on the, the control of now imagine primary outcome 39% reduction all cause mortality 30% composite cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure 30% reduction in dapa ckd and this was consistently happening people who were strictly non diabetic who did who gtt documented no diabetic gtt documented pre diabetic and this is what happens when people are actually diabetic so all across they seem to be doing something to the kidneys which is protective in heart failure uh, we know uh, to look at these are some of the very well established doctor about trials in endocrinology and diabetes you can read it was one of the first uh, uh, trials what were glycemic control you achieved in those times for 40 years data for 40 years is known about you could be this trial there was hardly any impact on cardiovascular system there was a much and now we have a data on a myriad of patients no if you look at declare 40% people had a cardiovascular established cardiovascular disease others did not have that's what happens in our clinic every day everybody does not have a cognizable coronary artery disease upper right everybody had an established coronary artery disease full statinized and canvas and words again is predominant established coronary artery disease and this is what dapagliflozin show reduce risk of heart failure hospitalization why is you know sometimes heart failure can be very difficult to diagnose so did the person get hospitalized would mean did he have a significant symptoms of heart failure that need in hospitalization that's why you know it's not an electrocardiogram and you have an ecg abnormal or you get an angiography or the hospitalization see you when you do a ejection fraction one might say more than 55 i don't know i say no it's 45 only so this reduces the intra observer variability right so that's why hospitalization for heart the reduction what is the cause hospital for heart failure whether a person had an established baseline heart disease or heart failure benefit goes to the by in all these studies so cardiovascular mortality benefit all cause mortality benefit and hospitalization for heart failure benefit and low below i showed you about the benefit if you are urinary atrial creatinine reduction and non renal specific outcomes what is happening to egfr what is happening to doubling of the creatinine what is happening to microproteinuria what is happening to macroproteinuria and composite cardiovascular death and heart failure death can not be a fake one just be taken care of huge data available over a period of one and a half decades now in all these aspects so in summary whenever you suspect heart failure or ckd and that secretly not but you and me take secretly in the clinic that creatinine a dropping of the egfr worsening of the ejection fraction we need to make this things early and recognize other maladies because if we do there will be a 17% risk reduction for cardiovascular death 27% reduction in hospitalization for heart failure 
and 47 study the reduction in the requirement for the replacement therapy. And DAPA security showed it in a much better way. 39% reduction and sustained 50% reduction in PGFR decline. The decline had a longer slope than a dip. 30% risk reduction in heart failure and all cause mortality. So, before I wind up, not only see, ADA was saying all along, take cognizance of glycemia, which is paramount. You cannot do any cardiac production if somebody's hemoglobin even say 12. It doesn't happen. It has to be respectable. Blood pressure management, lipid, but agents with cardiovascular and kidney benefit need to be incorporated wherever possible to protect. Now this is, as I was telling you, in my younger days, diabetes used to occur at the age of 48, right? And if a person would live, he will die at 65 with the treatment, right? And that will be living less than two decades, right? Now the same diabetes in our country is occurring at the age of 29. You are letting him die at the age of 43. And that's what is happening when you say, there was a sudden death in the neighborhood. Uh, how does it happen? Just because these things are not recognized. Before I sign up, this is a paper that our group published last week on the eve of World Diabetes Day today, uh, when, during RSD. Came in uh, a lancet on that very day. And literally, it is shattering our all beliefs. We have been hoaxed all along. We are nowhere near it. We postulated, as I told you, we had 1 crore diabetics when I did post-graduation. We had 1.9 crore diabetics when I became a professor. We had 6.4 crore diabetics when I left Sikkim's. We had 7.7 7 crore diabetics when COVID set in. And we were told by end of study last year we had 101 crore diabetics. This is a reanalysis of the data of this this data is from 1990 to 2020. The whole show is happening with us. This is our session. <coughs> Southeast Asia and China is the epicenter of this whole phenomenon. Because we are quantitatively more, <coughs> we are more centrally obese and we have a problem. And just look at it. We have 800 million people who are living in diabetes. Can you beat it? One quarter of us live among us to you and me, just 22 crores. And if that wasn't sufficient, this is also looking at how the care has been. This is the Western world high income. This is the why the care is employed. This is why it's not. This is us. The total quantum is increasing. But the increase in the care is better than 99. But nowhere near we need to. That's why you know. We need to be more responsible. Teams. Thank you so much. Sorry for taking 30 seconds. Everybody can tell you. So, look at it. Here is the big, big, broad base for diagnosis in my view. And that's where we lose that window of opportunity to change the natural history of a disease. Now, look at it. If you look at it, no treatment. You don't give a treatment a person gets renal failure here. You get the little treatment. You add on an average four years of quality life before a person would need a renal replacement therapy. I'm so like, you know, you give a proper drug, you delay possibility of a renal transplant or dialysis by four years. If you give it right in time. Now what does that mean right in time? Now look at it. You have an easier fat, more than 60, which it should be in most of the people, particularly younger people, 70, 80, 90 plus 100. Now, this is where we are, need to be. And when it starts dropping down, this is not real, it's good. And here, I have to see, at least here we need to take care of it. The moment EGFR reaches the 60 or less, we need to put protective mechanisms in place to save this kidney. But that does not happen. Because now creatinine at that stage only 1.3 has gone to 1.4. Nothing has changed in a big way. And by the time it's here, that's where 
two out of three comes in, it would not reverse in a very good way. So in a similar fashion, if you look at proteinuria, normal to mild increase, if you have less than three milligrams per mole, it's the great window of opportunity intravenous. Moderate, yes, good, you can still make impact at any stage. But if you delay it, particularly in this, say hand stage kidney disease, proteinuria, there is no preventive strategy, there is only management strategy, real replacement therapy. Now we have heard of credence, uh, we have heard of apostrocating, we have empacating, but this is not what I am telling you. This is the cardiovascular outcome studies, not talking about cardiovascular outcome. All these data showed that it has a renoprotective effect. It had come on before they looked at the specific kidney points. If you look at phase two, phase three clinical trials, the accumulated data shows that it has a renoprotective effect. And even in the declare, which was a cardiovascular outcome trial, you can see when renal failure was EGF problems, 47 percent risk reduction in those people who were on double when we did not talk about renal protection. These studies were going on and we were initially looking at is it a good oral hypoglycemic? Is it a safe hypoglycemic? Then we are saying is it cardiovascular safe? And this was data already there, which was never brought to the fore. Now look at it. Somebody whose EGFR is dropping does not have what you and me conceive as renal failure. Gradient of tooth. <coughs> or what you and me consider as heart failure, why we need <coughs> if you have to inhibit us, beta blockers, why MADAs and <coughs> pseudobutal, OSAT and combinations. If you look at laboratory determined renal dysfunction and heart failure, then you look at people and follow them up. All when you look at renal outcomes in the long term better people who are undapable as well. And stage kidney disease lesser in people who are double Cardiovascular death benefits. And stage kidney disease or even death, huge benefit to the double. In that people as you study. Now if you look at just urine albumin creatinine ratio, if you start it, either significant reversal of macroproteinuria or reduction of macroproteinuria or Non progression again favors to double glaciers. Now, if you specifically talk about the CKD, DAPA CKD was a very amazing trial, data on more than 5,000 guys. They looked at this molecule for preventing the progression of the renal disease in diabetics as well as in non diabetics. And this study, like credence, had to be stopped in the middle because data monitoring community found out that people who were on dapagliflozin had a huge benefit to say it will be unethical if the drug is not given to people who have who are not on dapaglyph, who are on the, the control. Now imagine primary outcome, 39 percent reduction, all cause mortality, 30 percent. Composite cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure, 30% reduction in double CKD. And this was consistently happening to people who were strictly non diabetic, who GTT documented no diabetes, GTT documented pre diabetes. And this is what happens when people are actually diabetic. So, all across, they seem to be doing something to the kidneys which is protective. In heart failure, uh, we know, uh, if you look at, these are some of the very well established and talked about trials in endocrinology and diabetes. Eukapedia was one of the first uh, uh, trials. Whatever glycemic control you achieved in those times for 40 years, data for 40 years is known about Eukapedia's trial. There was hardly any impact on cardiovascular system. There was much and now we have a data on a myriad of patients. No, if you look at declare 
40 percent of people had a cardiovascular, established cardiovascular disease, others did not have. That's what happens in our cavity. Everybody, everybody does not have a cognizable coronary artery disease. Upper head, everybody had an established coronary artery disease, full statinized. And canvas and words again is predominantly established coronary artery disease. And this is what epigalitism showed. Reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization. Why is, you know, sometimes heart failure can be very difficult to diagnose. So, did the person get hospitalized would mean, did he have a significant symptom of heart failure that needed hospitalization? That's why you know. It's not an electrocardiogram and you have an ECG abnormal or you get an angiography or the hospitalization. See, even when you do an ejection fraction, one might say more than 55, another might say no, it's 45 or more. So, this reduces the inter-observer variability, right? So that's why hospitalization for heart the reduction, 27 percent reduction. Hospitalization for heart failure, whether a person had an established baseline heart disease or heart failure, benefit goes to DARPA in all these studies. So cardiovascular mortality benefit, all-cause mortality benefit, and hospitalization for heart failure benefit. And low below, I showed you about the benefit if you have urinary and creatinine ratio, abnormal. Renal specific outcomes, what is happening to EGFR, what is happening to doubling of the creatinine, what is happening to microproteinuria, what is happening to macroproteinuria, and composite cardiovascular death and heart failure. Death cannot be a fake one, it has to be taken care of. Huge data available over a period of one and a half decades now in all these aspects. So, in summary, whenever we suspect heart failure or CKD, and that CKD not, but you and me take CKD in the clinic, that creatinine, a dropping of the EGFR, worsening of the ejection fraction, we need to make decisions early and recognize other maladies. Because if we do, there will be a 17 percent risk reduction for cardiovascular death. 27 percent reduction in hospitalization of heart failure and 47 starting reduction in the requirement for the replacement therapy. And DAPA security showed it in a much better way 39 percent reduction and sustained 50 percent reduction in EGFR decline. The decline had a longer slope than a dip. 30 percent risk reduction in heart failure and all cause mortality. So, before I wind up, not only see, ADA was saying all along, take cognizance of glycemia, which is paramount. You cannot do any cardiac production if somebody is hemoglobin a one stage 12. It doesn't happen. It has to be respectable. Blood pressure management, lipid, but agents with cardiovascular and kidney benefit need to be incorporated wherever possible to protect. Now, this is, as I was telling you, in my younger days, diabetes used to occur at the age of 48, right? And if a person would live, he will die at 65 with the treatment, right? And that will be living less than two decades, right? Now the same diabetes in our country is occurring at the age of 29. You are letting him die at the age of 43. And that's what is happening when you say, there was a sudden death in the neighborhood. just because these things are not recognized. Before I sign off, this is a paper that our group published last week on the eve of World Diabetes Day today, uh, even during RSD. Came in uh, Lancet on that very day. And literally, it is shattering over all beliefs. We have been hoaxed all along. We are nowhere near it. We postulated, as I told you, we had one color diabetics when I did post-graduation. We had 1.9 crore diabetics when I became a professor. We had 6.4 crore diabetics when I left second. We had 7.7 crore diabetics when COVID set in. And we were told by end of study last year we had 101 crore diabetics. This is a reanalysis of the data of this year. 
This data is from 1990 to 2020. The whole show is happening with us. This is our session. <coughs> Southeast Asia and China is the epicenter of this whole phenomenon. Because we are quantitatively more, <coughs> we are more centrally obese and we have a problem. And just look at it. We have 800 million people who are living in diabetes. Can you meet it? One quarter of us live among us to you and me. It's 22 crores. And if that wasn't sufficient, this is also looking at how the care has been. This is the Western world high income. This is the why the care is employing. This is why it's not. This is us. The total quantum is increasing. But the increase in the care is better than 19. But nowhere near we need to. That's why you know we need to be more responsible. Thank you so much. Sorry for taking 30 seconds.